So he gives us three directives in this chapter that I think are so valuable. And the first one is right off the bat in verse 1, accept people. Accept one another. Verse 1, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. The first and most important principle when it comes to these kinds of debate is not to shun people who disagree, but to accept one another. To enter into a dialogue. To talk about it. And not just take a hard stance and reject anybody who doesn't disagree. No, accept one another when it comes to these disputable issues. Now he's not talking about Romans 13 and moral absolutes or essential biblical truths. He's talking about the things where Christians debate and they disagree, they see it differently. And we can come to two different conclusions and we're not necessarily wrong because we're acting in line with our own conscience and faith. And so the first directive is accept one another. My brother and I became Christians at the same time. We both accepted Christ on the same day at the same Billy Graham crusade. I'm three years older than he is. I went on to college, back to the college I was at. He went on to Wheaton College. And after I graduated from college, I went to Wheaton Graduate School. And um, in the second year that I was there, we roomed together. And um, my brother and I are totally different. He's an artist, I'm more of an analyst. In high school, he was in tennis, I like basketball. Um, you name the area. Our interests are totally different, and we also see the world quite differently. One of us must be left brain, one of us might, must be right brain. I don't know what's going on, but we've just disagreed our whole lives on just about every area. And after we became Christians, man, we would get into these debates. And I would try to pressure him and argue with him and try to get him to see things my way, like the importance. I remember we debated the importance of a quiet time every day. And I just kept on stressing, you've got to read your Bible every day. And he'd say, well, yeah, I read my Bible and I pray, but don't give me this everyday stuff. I'm led, I do it regularly, I do it frequently. And I mean, it's just this kind of thing. He wanted to be involved in this one group that I didn't think was so good, so I tried to persuade him not to get involved in this group, to get in the group I was in. That group was okay. Well, finally it got to the point that we had so much conflict that I knew something was off in my attitude, and I read one day Romans 14. And for the next month, I memorized the whole chapter. Because I knew I needed help from the Holy Spirit, and I needed help to learn how to accept my brother. And I remember how important it was, that verse, I think it's verse 4, you know, who are you to judge your brother? To his own Lord, he will stand and fall, and the Lord is able to make him stand. It's not up to me to make him stand. It's the Lord who will make him stand. I'm to accept him on these kinds of debating issues. And so the first directive that we're given here very clearly is that we're not to pass judgment. We're not to look down. We're not to condemn if people disagree with us on these debatable issues. Because God has accepted them 
They're a Christian just as much as we are. And God is able to make them stand. Now, there's a second directive in this passage, and it's in verse 5. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So Paul's saying that first we need to accept each other in these debatable areas, but then secondly, we can come to our own personal conviction. And we should. We should study Scripture. And we should come to a conviction as to how we look at these things. We don't have to be wimpy. We don't have to be wishy-washy. We don't have to have no idea what we believe in these areas. No, let everyone be fully convinced in their own mind. There's a famous uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln, the great American president. The name of the biography is Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. She makes this very interesting single statement that really caught my attention. She says that though Abraham Lincoln did not drink alcohol, and though he did not smoke tobacco, oh, that's one I forgot, and though he didn't use profane language, well, that's really never to be permitted, or engage in games of chance, gambling. He never condescended to those who did. Even though he didn't smoke alcohol, he didn't look down or smoke tobacco or drink alcohol, even though he didn't, or gamble, he didn't look down on people who had a different way of living. And yet he had his own personal conviction that he himself in his own life would not practice these things. Well, I think one of the biggest areas of debate and discussion when it comes to this whole area is alcohol. I mean, in America, we went through a period of time where we made drinking alcohol illegal. It's called prohibition. Created all kinds of unintended consequences of criminal activities, smuggling in alcohol. It was a mess because laws like that on disputable issues are not wise. But when it comes to the use of alcohol, I want to read you an interesting story. Before I read this, I'll just mention to you, my personal conviction is I don't drink alcoholic beverages. My wife doesn't drink alcoholic beverages. That's just our personal conviction. Now, we have a lot of members of our family who do drink alcoholic beverages. And we don't look down on them. But we are fully convinced in our mind that we're not going to drink alcoholic beverages. But I want to tell you a story that uh, is pretty interesting because it's a story of a Christian who actually helped his own society and people and I think the Christians who lived in this country through doing something about alcohol that I never would have thought of. The story begins in 1759 and a determined man named Arthur Guinness, 34 years of age, bought an old brewery in Dublin, Ireland. It had been, it had been for sale for 10 years but nobody showed any interest in it because beer was almost unknown in rural Ireland, everybody drank whiskey and gin. It was cheap, it was high in alcoholic content, it was readily available, and as a result of all this whiskey and gin, alcoholism and people dropping out of life was widespread. Well, Arthur Guinness was a devout Christian, and he was concerned about the plight of all these young Irish drunks who wandered around because they were all drinking all this whiskey and gin. They were found on every, nearly every street corner. So once when he was walking in the streets of Dublin, he cried out to God to do something about the general drunkenness of Irish society. And he felt overwhelmed to be part of the answer to his own prayer. 
And he decided then and there that he would brew a drink that the Irish would enjoy that would also be better for them. And so Guinness decided to brew a beer that was based on barley. It was characteristically darker than other drinks of alcohol at the time. It was very heavy. It was full of iron so that most drinkers couldn't have more than a couple of pints. And this fact, uh, combined with the fact that there was a lower alcohol level than whiskey or gin, meant that much fewer people in Ireland were getting drunk. And so young Arthur Guinness made a beverage for the Irish that now is the national drink of Ireland and people drink it all over the world. Now I never would have thought of that because I'm not interested in alcohol at all. But you know, I'm glad that in this disputable issue, Arthur Guinness did this. And I accept it. And I accept that we have a difference in our own personal convictions on the use of alcohol. And I believe that that's part of what God wants in the local church on all of these issues. That first, we would accept one another and not make everything a moral absolute. Secondly, that we'd come to our own personal convictions. And then the third directive that Paul gives to us here is in verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. This is the principle in Scripture of not being a stumbling block. And this is often, I believe, misunderstood. Because I've heard people put it this way. Let's say um, about having a television in your home. You know, a person might say, I think having a television is wrong. Another person says, I can watch television in faith. I'm careful with what I watch. But... I have the faith to have a TV. Two different viewpoints. Now Paul would say, accept one another. Be fully convinced in your own mind what's best for you. And then third, don't be a stumbling block. Now what's that mean? Well, I want to suggest to you that not being a stumbling block does not mean that the person with the TV needs to get rid of it, lest this person who doesn't believe in TVs would somehow stumble over the fact they had one. That's not what it means. I believe it's been misinterpreted that way at times, that that's what a stumbling block means. No, this is what a stumbling block means. What a stumbling block means is that if this family came over to this person's house, They don't have to get rid of the TV. They don't have to put it out in the garage. But they should not turn it on. Because this family doesn't watch TV. And so if this family says, Oh, we're we're free in Christ. We're full of joy. We love TV. Come on, on, everybody. We're going to turn the TV on and show you how great this is. What's happening? This family is creating a stumbling block for this family. By pushing them to do something against their own conscience. That's what Paul means by don't be a stumbling block. Not get rid of your TV because this person looks down on TVs. But don't bring them in and cause them to stumble by doing something their own conscience doesn't allow. And the same thing's true with alcohol. I can go out with friends, and they can have their Guinness, and I can have my coffee, and um, we respect each other. We accept one another. They accept the fact I don't drink alcohol. I accept the fact that they do. Now, if they all of a sudden said, Rick, man, you've never had a Guinness? 
What's wrong with you? You're not living life. Come on. What would they be doing? They'd be creating a stumbling block because I don't have the faith and the freedom of conscience to go drink that Guinness with them. But if we honor one another, then we'll enjoy our time. We accept one another. We're not creating stumbling blocks. And we're each fully convinced in our own mind. And friends, I believe that in all these areas of disputable issues in a local church, this is a corner that churches turn or they don't turn. And if a church can't turn the corner in understanding that there's a difference between the essentials of doctrine and ethics and the non-essentials of doctrine and ethics. If we can't understand that, then we are going to have small, constricted, narrow, unaccepting churches. But if we can turn this Romans 14 corner, I believe that we'll be able to live our lives as believers, accepting each other and having our own convictions and not putting stumbling blocks in each other's way. And that we'll also live out the wonderful words of John Chrysostom. Most people attribute this to him when he said that in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, diversity. In all things, Jesus Christ. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.